Americans, true to the human ecology paradigm made famous by cultural geographers, have adopted technologies to issue warnings of impending life-threatening weather events. Rudimentary attempts to understand and predict tornadoes were made back in 1882 by Lieutenant John Park Finley of the Army Signal Corps. By 1884, he had established 15 rules for tornado forecasting. However, Finley's tornado research took a bad turn when, in 1887, General Adolphus Greeley became chief of the Corps. The new chief decided that it was impossible to accurately predict the exact location of tornadic touchdowns, so he ordered the use of the word tornado stricken from public forecasts. He was afraid that they would cause you know, untold alarm and, and, and hysteria. Over a half century later, the Weather Bureau in 1943 implemented experimental tornado warning systems for a limited number of places or locations. They included Wichita, Kansas, Kansas City, Missouri, and of course, St. Louis, Missouri. In June 1944, weather observers in those cities began to include thunderstorms, hailstorms, lightning, and high winds in their forecasts. It was not until March 25, 1948 that the military and the Weather Service were convinced that it was possible to forecast a tornado for a general location. Using the basic empirical approach devised by Finley, Major Ernest J. Faubish and Captain Robert C. Miller of the United States Air Force predicted a touchdown for Tinker Air Force Base near Oklahoma City. Their feat was even more impressive because just five days earlier on March 20th, a tornado had destroyed some 32 military aircraft, causing $10 million in damages on the same base. The idea that a specific location like Tinker could suffer two tornado touchdowns in less than a week was not thought possible. Nevertheless, the Fawbush and Miller forecast had enabled base commanders to implement a tornado safety plan. And, although the tornado of March 25th caused $6 million in damages, no lives were lost. That's a good thing. Calls for a national weather warning system uh, <clears throat> were put in place shortly thereafter. And despite those folks' success at Tinker Air Force Base, it took another five years and hundreds of more lives to force Congress to create a national warning system. Tornado outbreaks in Arkansas, Missouri, and Tennessee killed over 150 people on March 21, 1952 as a result of an ensuing public outcry for a national tornado warning system, Congress authorized the creation of the Severe Local Storms SELS Center within the Weather Bureau. It became operational in June 1953, but it wasn't soon enough to save hundreds of lives lost that same year. On May 11, 1953, a tornado killed 114 people in Waco, Texas. A few weeks later, in early June, a cold front moved across Michigan's lower peninsula. With the jet stream creating an upper-level wind shear, a tornado formed and touched down at Flint. It killed 115 residents. The same system then traveled eastward across Lake Ontario and Lake Erie, where on June 9th it produced another powerful vortex that tore through Worcester, Massachusetts. This time, the death toll was lighter. Only 90 people were killed. Thanks in large measure to the uh, implementation of technology to predict and then warn residents of a potential threat, lives have been saved. Until the outbreaks of 2011, only two of the 25 deadliest tornadoes occurred since the National Warning System was established in 1953. Since that year, most of the research on tornadoes has been focused on developing technology to make accurate predictions and then warn people in sufficient time for them to take shelter. Nevertheless, there's room for improvement in warning systems and building construction materials, although few existing materials and structures can resist the projectiles hurled at them by an F4 or F5 tornado. Indeed, even concrete sidewalks 
and asphalt roads had been uprooted and sent flying across the landscape. All the same, Doppler radar and early warning systems <coughs> have saved perhaps thousands of lives from powerful tornadoes. Consider the case of the F5 tornado of May 3rd, 1999. There were more than a dozen tornadoes that touched down on that spring day in Oklahoma. This particular funnel stayed on the ground for hours, strengthening as it traveled northeast toward Oklahoma City, the capital. By the time the vortex reached Midwest City, a suburb of the state capital, it was a, a massive F5 and produced a superlative wind velocity of 318 miles per hour. That's the highest wind speed ever, ever recorded. That velocity also marks the threshold of an F6. Continuing to move in an east-northeast trajectory, the colossal tornado mercifully ripped its path east of the state capital. Once the swirling funnel passed Oklahoma City, it skipped over parcels of farm and ranch lands. The killer of 44 Oklahomans followed the Will Rogers Parkway, that's Interstate 44, until it dissipated before reaching Tulsa. But before it died, it leveled a strip mall at Stroud. While the death toll from this meteorological event pales in comparison to the 695 lives lost in the tri-state tornado of 1925, the fatalities could have been even lower, and they certainly could have been much, much higher. Failure to get the word out was not the case. And it wasn't the case either in Alabama and six other southern states in April 2011. Nor was it a problem in Oklahoma on May 3, 1999. Not only were Oklahomans warned through official channels, including municipal sirens, television news teams followed and filmed the monster as it approached and then leveled population centers. At the time, I was living less than one mile from Interstate 44 in Ottawa County, Oklahoma. A friend and colleague of mine lived in Claremore, a city just east of Tulsa, the home of Will Rogers. With our uh, eyes glued to our respective televisions, we spent most of the evening on the phone discussing the tornado as we watched it approach our homes. While the vortex did not reach either of us, we nevertheless experienced high velocity winds, lightning, and torrential rain. More importantly, we had ample warning to find shelter, which because of the severity of the damage caused by the vortex, would have had to be in an underground storm shelter. Moving to a central room in either of our houses would not have saved us. Even ranch homes made of sturdy brick were leveled. Building technology certainly has its limits in withstanding a storm of that magnitude. But most of the people had ample time to find shelter or get out of the storm's path. Sadly, however, many of the 44 Oklahomans who lost their lives that day believed that they were safe, for they had taken refuge in what they presumed to be storm-safe shelters. Now, some of the victims who were killed or injured had taken shelter in one of the most precarious, dangerous types of places one can find in the path of a tornado. Deciding to hide under a highway overpass is perhaps understandable. Most of us who have traveled on interstates <clears throat> have witnessed vehicles parked under uh, overpasses or bridges during intense storms, especially those that produce hail. Motorcyclists, too, are attracted to overpasses to escape the torrential downpours. The fact is that the restricted space created by the bridge and the ground uh, channels higher velocity winds and debris between the bridge and the ground. <laughs> it's the same effect as placing one's thumb over the end of a running water hose. Because the thumb restricts the uh, space at the terminal end of the hose, the velocity there increases so the volume of water traveling through the hose can remain constant. The same principle applies to air and winds. The safety of an underpass is hence an illusion, and it's one that should be avoided in the presence of a tornado. While there is no guarantee of safety from any tornado that passes over one's outdoor location, the chances of survival are 
much greater in a low-lying ditch. However, <laughs> many ditches in the southeastern United States, which happens to be in Tornado Valley too, not in the Great Plains, but there is a Tornado Valley in Dixieland, are often wet and serve as, serve as the homes of cottonmouths or water moccasins. Clearly, it's prudent to watch where one takes refuge. Still, an unknown number of Americans can thank the folks who developed our current tornado warning system. Thanks for joining me today. I look forward to seeing you again here on the Vantage Point. In the meantime, may the good Lord bless and keep you. Bye-bye. Thank you.